Let's take a look now at some properties of isomorphisms. This first set of properties all have to do with what we can expect from the elements of G and G bar. So not the groups themselves, but the specific elements. Now I'm going to tell you that if you watched video 6.2, we've already talked about quite a few of these because I made them very clear as we were doing our mappings. So the first is that phi carries the identity of G to the identity of G bar. Basically what we're saying is the identities need to map to one another. For two, every integer n and every a that is an element of G, phi of a to the n is equal to phi of a to the nth power. Now what you need to remember here is that you have to keep with the same operations that um, G and G bar have. So while this is shown as multiplicative, keep in mind it could be additive as well if that is what you're dealing with in your specific group. For three, any elements A and B in G, A and B commute only if phi of A and phi of B commute. So essentially we're saying if G is a billion, then G bar is a billion and vice versa. For four, G is generated by A if and only if G bar is generated by phi of A. So again, we're saying that the generators of a set need to map to one another. For five, the order of A has to be equal to the order of phi of A for all A and G. So again, the order of elements are preserved. Now, if you'll keep in mind, we made these two very clear when we did our example with U10 being isomorphic to U5. We were, and, and the first property as well, we made sure to map the identity to the identity. We made sure that um, the generators of each set map to each other, and we made sure that the orders of the elements mapped um, correspondingly. For six, for a fixed integer k and a fixed b in g, the equation x to the k equal, equals b has the same number of solutions in g, as does the equation x to the k equals phi of b in g bar. So again, we're just saying that they're not necessarily going to have the same solutions. We're talking about the same number of solutions. We haven't really looked at that one and that's not one that we're going to spend a lot of time on. And finally, if G is finite, then G and G bar have the same number of elements of every order. So again, we made this one very clear as well. When again, when we looked at U10 and U5, both had four elements. And as we were going through those elements, I said, hey, if they have a different number of elements, then we don't even have to keep checking. We know they're not isomorphic, so they have to have the same number of elements, and those elements need to correspond according to order. These properties hold to the groups, not the elements, but the groups themselves. And again, we've touched on a few of these, and some we haven't talked about at all. So the first one is phi inverse is an isomorphism from G bar onto G, which makes perfect sense because if we're talking about two groups and we're saying that there's some mapping from this group to this group called phi, that was a horrible phi, then there's some mapping that takes that same element back to where it started and that's called phi inverse because the inverse always undoes whatever was done with the original function. For two, G is abelian only if and only if G bar is abelian. Um, we have talked about three, G is cyclic if and only if G bar is cyclic. And four and five have to do kind of with this same idea up here. A subgroup of G maps to subgroups of G bar and vice versa. So just as phi um, is undone by phi inverse, if I have some function that has some subgroup and it's going to map to the subgroup or map back to the original subgroup. Same thing with the center. So essentially what we're saying is all of those things need to correspond. I want to take a look at two previous examples with you. 
uh, one an infinite set and one a finite set. And again, we went over both of these examples in video 6.2, where we talked about how to prove they were isomorphisms. So now I just want to look at some of the properties with you. So the first is Z under addition, so the integers under addition, which was isomorphic to the even integers under addition. And we defined phi of x to be equal to 2x. So the first property that the identity has to map to the identity. And I know that the identity of the integers under addition, the identity is zero, and that's the same for the even uh, integers under addition. So as we can see, if I take phi of zero, phi of zero is equal to two times zero, which is equal to zero. And so the identity did map to the identity. For the next property, this one's a little bit harder to show, um, especially because when I look at the property here, this property is written um, for multiplicative, so a to the nth power, as opposed to uh, here, we're dealing with additive notation. So four times x, which would just be repeated addition four times. So phi of four x is equal to 2, based on phi, it says take 2 times whatever's inside. So 2 times 4x, which is 8x. I can rewrite 8x as 4 times 2x, and 2x can be rewritten as phi of x. And so does that in fact hold true? Yes, because I'm saying phi of 4x, so 4 times x instead of 4 to the x or x to the fourth is equal to phi of x times 4. So it does hold true. For the next property, any elements a, b, and g, a and b commute, if and only if phi of a and phi of b commute, well, we know that both sets are commutative inherited from the laws of addition. The next property uh, if G, G is generated by A, if and only if G bar is generated by phi of A. Well, we know that G is generated by both 1 and by negative 1. Again, because we would just keep adding and adding and adding and adding. And G bar is generated by 2 and negative 2. And 2 and negative 2 are, in fact, phi of 1 and phi of negative 1. And so that does hold true. The order of A is equal to the order of phi of A for all A and G. Uh, this one's easier to see when you have a finite set with an explicit mapping that we're going to look at next. But obviously we can see that the order of one would be equal to the order of two, the order of negative one equal to the order of negative two, and then um, you know all of the other values that map to one another would have the same order as well. Next, for a fixed integer k and a fixed b in g, the equation x to the k equals b has the same number of solutions in g as does the equation x to the k equals phi of b in g bar. And again, this is one of those that we don't use very often, kind of like this guy up here. These are both um, not properties we use often, but I just gave you an example here. Again, because we're dealing with additive notation where I'm not going to take x to the k, I'm taking eight times x equals 24, has one solution. Phi of eight is 16, so eight times x equals 16 also has the same number of solutions. And then lastly, we're looking at finite sets and obviously these are not finite sets, so this one does not apply. Let's take a look now at another example. And again, we did this example in 6.2 as well. So again, if you have not watched video 6.2, please go back to do that. This example will make much more sense. Um, when we looked at these, again, U10 is the set of all integers less than 10 that are relatively prime to 10. And U5 is the set of all integers less than five, relatively prime to five. So U10 was comprised of one, three, seven and nine, and U5 was comprised of one, two, three, four. 
And what we had to do is we had to choose which elements were going to map to which other elements. And so a lot of these properties, we made sure that we followed as we did the mapping. So fee carries the identity uh, in each set. So obviously if we're dealing with modular, modular multiplication, one is the identity. And we were very sure that we made sure phi of one mapped to one. For every integer n and for every a in g, phi of a to the n is equal to phi of a to the nth power. I do want to point out to you the difference between this example and the last example. Here we are dealing with modular multiplication. So notice here I'm using 3 squared as opposed to in our last example where I was just multiplying instead of taking powers. So phi of 3 squared is phi 9. Phi of 9, based on our mapping, is 4. I can rewrite 4 as 2 squared. 2 squared, 2 is the same as phi of 3, and so phi of 3 squared, and so again, this holds true. The next property, any elements a and b and g, a and b commute, if and only if phi of a and phi of b commute, and of course, we're, we know both sets are commutative from the laws of modular arithmetic. Uh, if G is generated by A, or G is generated by A, if and only if G bar is generated by phi of A. Again, we were very clear when we did our mapping that 3 generated the set of G and 2 generated the set of G bar, so we mapped those together. Also, 7 and 3 from G and G bar respectively map the entire set, and therefore we mapped those together. Next, the order of A has to equal the order of phi of A. And again, when we did our mapping, we made very clear or made very sure that we mapped the correct items together. So one from G and one from G bar both have order one, and that's why we mapped those. Three from G and two from G bar both had order four, and so we mapped those together. 7 from G and 3 from G bar both had order 4. And 9 from G and 4 from G bar both had order 2. Um, if G is finite, then G and G bar have the same number of elements of every order. Again, they both have four elements, and both sets have one element of order 1, two elements of order 4, and one element of order 2. Lastly, I just wanted to throw out G is cyclic if and only if G bar is cyclic, and obviously both of these sets are cyclic, generated by 3 or 7 or 2 or 3. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at automorphisms.